Welcome to the early medieval history of England and how the country came into being. If you find it greatly, please click on the like button and don't forget to leave a comment. Now for episode four, after the pause for breath. The Angles had first conquered the coast of East Anglia, North Angle folk and South Angle folk, becoming later Norfolk and Suffolk, but had not as yet made great inroads into the interior. After the stalling of the onslaught at Baden Mount by Ambrosius Aurelianus, better known to us as King Arthur, there was a serious pause in the advance of the pagans. There is a lot of archaeological and dendrochronological, try saying that with your mouth full of wine gums, there is a lot of archaeological and dendrochronological evidence to suggest the weather had turned cold for a couple of decades. This would have had the effect of keeping the invaders at home, where they were needed to farm and ensure their families were fed. With little in the way of surplus food, a farmer would not risk leaving his family to starve. Also, because there wasn't actual famine, the population would either grow or at least be stable. It was just over a generation later that further inroads by the West Saxons into the country around Wessex were made. Pushing up to Old Sarum in Wiltshire in 552, then victory at Deorham against three British chiefs around the River Severn laid open the countryside beyond to the conqueror's sword and eventually they slaughtered their way to the Thames. We hear of a name in 571 when King Cuthwulf, a West Saxon, took Oxfordshire and Berkshire before being halted by the Christian Britons just before London. The time of the heathen men of Wessex had not yet come. Meanwhile, quietly in 565, across the Irish Sea, a monk named Columba came from Ireland to the tiny isle of Iona, just off the southern tip of the Isle of Mull, which is itself situated off the western coast of Scotland. And here he set up a monastery from which to preach the Christian faith to the Picts. It is from the north that the largest pagan games are made. As the Angles moved down the Trent and into the East Midlands and as far west as Lichfield. The fens of Holderness give way to the tramp of Angle feet as they marched over the Yorkshire Wolds to found the Kingdom of Deira. On up to the ancient Roman capital of Ibaracum, which is raised to the ground with fire then raised anew by the marauding masters and renamed Jorvik, which we know as modern day York. But the overbuilding is on a much lowlier scale. Through the rest of Yorkshire, found in the hamlet of Leodis, leads at a river crossing, which also comes under the Anglo-Saxon York. There is a gradual conquering of the whole of the northeast along the coast to Bamborough. Pirates raided upstream along the Tweed, followed by Ida or Iden and the men of the 50 Keels, who founded a fort, Idensburg, now Edinburgh. What is history without pirates? But the town of Jorvik was a village in comparison with what the Romans had left. The archaeology of the 32 other Roman cities suggests they were already hollow shells, sparsely inhabited, one wonders what happened to the majority of the people who once populated these Roman urban centres. Had they migrated to the villas to find work as labourers or bought farms of their own? An unlikely scenario. The legions had left. There were only a few people in the Roman towns. Easy prey for the invaders. Perhaps the few were slaughtered like so much livestock. Is this where the idea arose that the Anglo-Saxons murdered nearly the entire indigenous population? York was a substantial city under the Romans. Were the citizens just taken into slavery or was there wholesale rape, pillaging and massacre? Gildas bemoans, the barbarians drive us to the sea. The sea throws us back on the barbarians. Thus two modes of death await us. We are either slain or drowned. 
By the 6th century, the old Roman cities appear to be nearly abandoned. The later Bede breathes not a word. The kingdom of Deira had emerged in what is now Yorkshire. Meanwhile, further north, Ida and the men of 50 keels had consolidated that part of the country into Bernicia, from Edinburgh down to below Bamborough, on the Northumberland coast. This rocky outcrop he made his capital and built a wooden fortress on the rocky mount. There was then what seems to be a power struggle between the two kingdoms of Deira and Bernicia, with unrecorded skirmishes that went on between them until they were united under Ethelfrith at the beginning of the 7th century. He it was who had more vigour and strategy than any we have yet encountered in this history. He it was who united Northumbria and took on the rest of the North Britons in between these two northern settlements to make something worthy of the name Kingdom. The major conquest came in 603, when, with his brother Theobald, he fought the combined forces of the North Britons, including an Irish contingent under Aidan MacGabran. They were annihilated at the Battle of Daegestan at Liddesdale, Lothian, in the Scottish border region. Bede informs us that Theobald was killed, but he's quite ambiguous, and Theobald may have been fighting against his brother Ethelfrith and alongside Aidan. Whatever the lineup of either side, the Northumbrians won the day. Moving west in 607, Ethelfrith hit Chester, where 2,000 Christian monks had come from Bangor in North Wales and were lined up on a vantage point to pray for the Britons with wild gestures and outstretched arms. To Ethelfrith, it made no difference. Bear the arms, or oh no, they war against us when they cry against us to their god. This was the signal for attack, and the monks were the first to fall in the rout that followed. Ethelfrith then moved up into Lancashire with his angles, and effectively split the Britons in twain, one part receding into Wales, the other towards Carlisle and Hadrian's Wall, the old border with Scotland. This had pushed Ethelfrith's heathen forces to the west coast of England, into Lancashire, and now his kingdom stretched from there to the east coast, north of the border to Edinburgh, and down as far as Essex and Leicestershire in the Midlands, where they bordered with the Saxons. From this time on, the continuing war settles down to a long running sore between the Britons of Wales and Scotland and the Anglo-Saxons, that would continue on and off until Edward I's time. The Britons, being split in two, would no longer pose any serious threat, and thus the struggle would turn in on itself. Fighting would break out when the politics failed, as this would be a struggle for the heart of England and overlordship. But by the nature of the split and the countryside involved, it seems that the invaders did not regard the highlands or less productive land worth losing life over. A single king would emerge, and a single people, but the road of consolidation would take over 300 years and be potholed with struggles. Although we refer to Angles, Saxons and Dukes before this unified kingdom was coming to being, they were not three tribes under three individual kings that were invading. They were separate raiding parties, possibly different tribes and families under one leader, from the same regions who were finding areas to attack and then settle. As they did so and intermarried, the three peoples slowly melded, first into Angles and Saxons, and then to see themselves as Saxons. This is important about not being separate clans or families. They appear to be mixed tribes and families or gangs, under the leadership of an individual. This had consequences later and would make it easier for the different so-called tribes to intermix, as the strict loyalties of family or race were much looser. Certainly by the time of the Normans they seemed to call themselves Saxons, the later Vikings included. In the 6th and 7th centuries there was so little written information we are left mainly with conjecture and archaeological evidence to come to any worthwhile conclusions. 
and pots tend not to tell us what one person thought of another. The difference with the mainland of Europe and England is that the conquest by the English is complete. We may now have revised the idea that all the indigenous Britons were wiped out to the idea that it was a large percentage who was slain or the alternative that a minority who were put to death but whatever you say, Roman Britannia was conquered and it was Germanic tribes that were the conquerors speaking a mongrel Germanic language that had lost its genders. The archaeology does tell us that both men and women were tall and well built in fact very close to modern day heights. Their life expectancy however was short probably shorter than the Roman with their better sanitation. Although it appears the Anglo-Saxon diet was generally very good, this however should be tempered with the thought that famine could easily occur with bad harvests due to inclement weather and the frequent climate changes. There is ample evidence they stored food for the bad times, but the very nature of their more local way of life precluded vast imports from distant lands, as would occur while the Romans and capitalist free trade were in control. Also, they had no idea about hygiene or personal cleanliness. Running water was not the essential that the Romans had. The Anglo-Saxon toilet was a dry midden, whereas the Romans usually made their toilets over running water and had a sponge on a stick with which to wipe their posteriors clean so less likelihood of transmission of disease. The world the Anglo-Saxons created was different again from that of the ordered Roman society. Ornate mosaic floors and the hypercost central heating of the grand villas were gone. The forum in the town with the market and government buildings forgotten. No centralised government, so no centralised laws. The coinage and religion of one god swept away like a steady tsunami that went on and on and on. But then what was left behind exchanged for a new way of living. Much poorer to start with, but as we shall be seen, with much potential. If you found this greatly, please thumbs up and if possible, recommend to others on social media and click that subscribe button and ring the bell to get updates. I appreciate any constructive criticism and shall be bringing new videos out weekly. Thank you.